Welcome to Cancer Newsline, a podcast series from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Cancer Newsline helps you stay current with the news on cancer research, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention, providing the latest information on reducing your family's cancer risk. I'm your host, Lisa Garvin. Today, our guest is Dr. Shannon Weston. She is an assistant professor of gynecologic oncology here at MD Anderson, and our subject today will be uterine cancer. So, Dr. Weston, first of all, let's clear up the distinction between uterine and endometrial cancer. Are they the same name for this, different names for the same cancer or two different cancers? That's a great question. So essentially they are two names for the same cancer. The most common uterine cancer is endometrial. So when you think about the uterus, it has different layers. Um, The inside layer, um, which is the layer that builds up when a woman becomes pregnant, is called the endometrium. And that is where about 90, 95% of cancers will arise. And so we often, when we talk about cancers in general will just say endometrial cancer. There's a small subset of cancers that will arise in the muscle layer of the uterus. Those are called sarcomas. Um, And those will be about 5 to 7% of all uh, uterine cancers in general. What are the overall statistics for uterine cancer in the U.S.? So including both uterine um, as well as endometrial, um, we would see uh, in 2012, the ACS estimated about 47,000 women would be diagnosed with endometrial cancer and approximately 8,000 will um, die from endometrial cancer. And you say actually the numbers have stayed the same, the diagnosis numbers have stayed the same and maybe even increased slightly. What's going on there? Yeah, so contrary to what we've been seeing in other cancer types where the incidence is... um, reducing based on prevention efforts or just information that's getting out to the public, we're seeing a, a, at least a plateau, if not somewhat of a rise in the incidence of endometrial cancer. And that really is, be we think, strongly correlated with the epidemic of obesity in our country and across the world. Endometrial cancer, the endometrioid type especially, is tightly linked to estrogen um, and to an excess of estrogen. And that can be caused by women that are taking exogenous estrogen, like pills, um, but also can be related to what we call endogenous estrogen, which means your body's making its own estrogen. And we know that when women have um, extra fat cells or adipose cells, that those cells actually convert hormones into estrogen. And so we see that tight link between obesity and endometrial cancer. And we we, um, anticipate that that is one of the major reasons that we're not seeing any change. As far as uh, diagnosing uterine cancer, I I know that cervical cancer and ovarian particularly, the symptoms can be kind of silent. Are the symptoms obvious with uterine cancer? Yes, actually, that's one of the best, I don't know if you can call it the best parts of having endometrial cancer, is that patients generally will uh, present with bleeding. And so a lot of times before the tumor is too spread, so when it's still early, stage one, confined in the uterus, they'll be having bleeding, and we can capture it ahead of time and get them treated. Um, so that is one the major symptom that we do see with uterine cancer. Other symptoms would be things like discharge, pelvic pain, um, but the most common is bleeding. Do we tend to catch uterine cancers at an early stage? Mm-hmm. About 90% will be captured at stage one. And uh, uh, I think it's generally an older woman's disease. Does this disease creep down into people below the age of 40? Absolutely. You know, the median age is about 60 of diagnosis. However, we do see a proportion of patients, I think, at the last um, study that I read, it was about 15% or so that are less than 40. So this is, you know, it's becoming a younger woman's disease, and that's because it's tightly related to obesity. In general, the patients that we see that are younger with this disease tend to be obese. Um, There's also a um, hereditary syndrome that can put uh, women at a higher risk of developing uterine cancer. And in general, those patients will also be younger. But that's only in about 5% of uterine cancers. Is that Lynch right. syndrome? So it mm-hmm. used to be called hereditary non-polyposis um, um, colorectal cancer syndrome, but now it's called Lynch syndrome. And that's because in women, um, although the colon cancer is uh, can happen in about 40 to 60% of women, endometrial cancer can also occur in about 40 to 60% of those women. And actually, in a study that um, we did here, we found that often the endometrial cancer was the sentinel cancer or the first cancer for these patients and was the identifying cancer for these patients. And so they, they adjusted the name 
so as not to be misleading because those two cancers are so common in women that have Lynch syndrome. Now, it, since it is creeping into a younger population, obviously fertility and fertility sparing becomes very important. Absolutely. How do you address that? How and when do you address fertility issues? Well, this is a, actually an area of great interest for me. It's an area I'm doing research on. So this is a huge area of interest because a lot of these women, some of the other risk factors for endometrial cancer are no children, you know, um, no menopause, long, long time exposed to your menstrual cycle. And so these women would like to become pregnant. And then in st- when they're going through their workup to become pregnant, they're found to have an endometrial cancer. Um, usually these are early. And if they are early, there are conservative options for these patients. The main um, option that we've been looking at or that has been kind of well established is progesterone. So basically you have an excess of estrogen and progesterone is the hormone that counteracts that. And so you give these patients progesterone to try to, to counteract that. Unfortunately, it's not always effective, but it's, it's fairly effective. Um, in addition, it can be hard for patients to be compliant with it because there are a lot of symptoms that they get from progesterone, nausea, headaches, weight gain, and in a population that's already obese, that can be a very big issue. And so we have been exploring at Anderson um, utilizing the Mirena IUD or a levonorgestrel, which is a type of progesterone, in a uterine device. Now, this is something that's used for FDA approved for contraception and bleeding, um, but we're trying to repurpose it to potentially treat patients with early endometrial cancer. It um, sits in the uterus. It lasts for five years. And we're currently performing a phase two trial to see if it's effective and safe. Um, but you would have to remove that. If they were, were wanting right. to become pregnant, what happens then? Right. So the, that's the million-dollar question. So in general, what we've been doing is treating these patients for a year. If they clear and they're ready to become pregnant, we can remove the IUD, let them go on to to try to achieve pregnancy, however that might happen. And then ultimately, this would be a patient that we would advise would need a subsequent hysterectomy or removal of the uterus once she was done with fertility. And can you harvest eggs like you can with, I know with males, you can obviously bank sperm. Mm -hmm. Can you harvest eggs from women who may be concerned about their fertility afterwards? Absolutely. That's, it's, it's a growing area. And actually, we've been working on developing our onco fertility program here at MD Anderson to be able to offer that type of thing. And in how many cases is the uterus saved? I mean, I, it seems like, especially in the olden days, they were just like, just take it out. And, and that's still true. For the majority of patients, we would urge hysterectomy because that is a definitive treatment. Um, I don't know if I have percentages, but there are um, a significant proportion of patients. And if you look in the literature, maybe up to 75% of patients will have some response. It's the durable response that we're looking for. And in about 25% or so, it will come back. And so that's the trick is finding that window of opportunity to achieve fertility or achieve what you're looking for and then um, get that uterus out. (laughs) And I, I'm assuming that um, the surgery, either alone or in combination with others, is frontline therapy? Right. So frontline is um, surgery. And then based on the findings from surgery, this is a surgically staged disease. So at the time of surgery, the, the uterus is removed, cervix, fallopian tubes, ovaries, and potentially lymph nodes from the pelvis and periortic area or around the aorta. Based on the results of that pathology, the patient will be potentially treated with different therapies. Some patients don't require anything. If it's a very early tumor, it's not growing into the wall of the uterus, it's not involving any of the additional structures. Um, but in patients that the tumor is growing into the wall of the uterus or has other you know, high-risk features, they potentially might get radiotherapy, either just to the top of the vagina or even to the entire pelvis. Um, and, and that can be combined with chemotherapy in certain patients. You do say it does tend to recur in about 25% of the population? So with early. So with early tumors, if you're conservatively trying to to, um, to treat them. So in those patients being treated with oral progesterones or other progesterones, it, you can achieve a complete response, but there's a high chance that it's going to come back. Now, if we're looking at recurrence in general, um, the recurrence rates are are I would say about 15 to 20 percent in early stage disease. So majority of patients will do very, very well. And that's where we get our excellent survival from. But it's there's a sur- small group of patients with early stage disease that will recur. 
And then, of course, advanced stage. So this is stage three and four. This is, these are people that have tumor in their lymph nodes or in the abdomen and pelvis or lung or bladder. Those patients tend to do more poorly. Um, they We can achieve complete responses, but it's a much lower rate. Um, and in those cases that we do, their chance of recurrence is much higher. What about um, adjuvant therapy? Do you often follow up surgery with either radiation or chemo? So based on the path- pathologic results, we might treat with radiotherapy to the top of the vagina or to the pelvis. Um, Chemotherapy has been slowly um, increasing. We've been increasing our incorporation of chemotherapy, sometimes just along with radiotherapy and sometimes after. And that would be in patients with extremely high-risk features, either histology types that are high-risk, like serous tumors or um, clear cell tumors, or in patients that have involvement of the um, ovaries, the adnexal structures, or in the um, lymph nodes, the pelvic or periodic lymph nodes. What sort of research is being done on targeted therapies? Are there any Are there any targets yes. for targeted therapies? Actually, endometrial cancer is, has a wealth of opportunities for targeted therapies. There are many studies coming out right now. The TCGA um, is putting out some information about uterine cancer. But what we've found here at MD Anderson through our uterine spore is that almost 80% of these patients have some type of aberration, which could potentially be targeted. The majority of those patients um, have aberrations in what's called the PI3 kinase AKT pathway. This is a hot, hot pathway that basically is involved with survival. and, And, you know, it's what makes cancer turn into cancer. And there are many drugs that are being developed along this pathway, different in, um, inhibitors of different points along the pathway. And we think that um, these hold great promise for endometrial cancer. The studies are still pretty early. Um, the most developed of these have been the mTOR inhibitors, which is a lower player along the pathway. And the responses have been modest. We're looking at anywhere from 10 to 15 percent response rates. But the stable disease rate, which is a patient is on the treatment for a significant period of time without growth of cancer, um, those tend to be a little bit better approaching, you know, 30 or 40 percent. So we're certainly starting to scratch the surface. That's not what we're, that's not the goal we have, but we're starting to see a signal. um, And so there's multiple um, drugs that are being developed in this area, and we're very hopeful to get to look at them in um, endometrial cancer. Great. Thank you. Is there anything uh, in summary you would say to women who might be at risk for uterine cancer? What's your message to them? I would say um, weight loss is imperative. And, you know, knowing what your body mass index is, go on the on Google and figure out how to calculate it. You want to get it below 25 um, and, if nothing else, below 30. Okay, um, and that can help reduce your risk. If um, you want to talk with your doctor, if you're on hormone replacement therapy, make sure that it's safe for you and that it's appropriate for you. And any bleeding after you've gone through menopause should be evaluated as immediately. Um, and heavy irregular periods should also be evaluated with your doctor. So I think that the the main take up home point is that we can catch this early. Um, so if you've got any symptoms, you just got to get into your doctor and get it evaluated. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Weston. Thanks so much for having me. If you have questions about anything you've heard today on Cancer Newsline, contact Ask MD Anderson at 1-877-MDA-6789 or online at mdanderson.org slash ask. Thank you for listening to this episode of Cancer Newsline. Tune in for the next podcast in our series.